Hello everyone and welcome to Chapter Book Storytime Variety Pack. My name is Miss Ellen and I work at EVPL Oakland Branch Library and I'm really happy to be here today. And I know what you're thinking. You're probably looking in the background. Where's Miss Jessica? Well, Miss Jessica and I are now going to be sharing chapter book story time. And so you have two librarians sharing their favorite stories and reading aloud to you. I'm really excited to be joining Miss Jessica. She does a wonderful job. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun together. So let's get started. Uh, I've got two stories to share with you. One is a new book that came, has come into the library. And another one is a favorite read aloud of mine. And they're both fantasy stories, which I think will be fun. We can compare them. So let's get settled in a nice, comfortable chair, um, if you'd like, while you're listening. If it helps you to pay attention or to listen, to have something to do with your fingers, um, you can get some drawing paper, some coloring pages, crayons, markers, and you can sit and draw while you listen. Sometimes I do that while I'm listening to an audiobook. It, for some reason, it helps me pay attention. So if you'd like to try that, go ahead, that's fine, and we'll get started. My first story for you today is a fantasy story. It has all the traditional fantastical creatures, like dragons, trolls, witches, all of that. Thing, all of that. Uh, we might even call it a fractured fairy tale because it is a retelling of traditional stories. This is called The Hero's Guide to Saving Your Kingdom by Christopher Healy. It's a fantasy story and um, a lot of fun to read. It's one of my favorite read-alouds. And so I'll start with the prologue. Things you don't know about Prince Charming. Prince Charming is afraid of old ladies. Didn't know that, did you? Don't worry, there's a lot you don't know about Prince Charming. Prince Charming has no idea how to use a sword. Prince Charming is, has no patience for dwarves. Prince Charming has an irrational hatred of capes. Some of you may not even realize that there's more than one Prince Charming and that none of them are actually named Charming. No one is. Charming is not a name. It's an adjective. But don't blame yourself for your lack of Prince Charming-based knowledge. Br blame those lazy bards. You see, back in the day, bards and minstrels were the world's only real source of news. It was they who bestowed fame upon people. They were the ones who sculpted any hero or villain's reputation. Whenever something big happened, a damsel was rescued, a dragon was slain, a curse was broken, the royal bards would write a song about it, and their wandering minstrels would perform the tune from land to land, spreading the story across multiple kingdoms. But the bards weren't very keen on details. Well, they didn't think it was important to include the names of the heroes who did all that damsel rescuing, dragon slaying, and curse breaking. They just called all those guys Prince Charming. It didn't even matter to the bards whether the person in question was a true, daring hero, like Prince Liam, who battled his way past a bone-crushing, fire-blasting, magical monster in order to free a prince princess from an enchanted sleeping spell, or some guy who merely happened to be in the right place at the right time, like Prince Duncan, who also woke a princess from a sleeping spell, but only because some dwarves told him to. No, those bards gave a man the same generic name whether he nearly died, like Prince Gustav, who was thrown from a 90-foot tower when he tried to rescue Rapunzel, or simply impressed a girl with his dancing skills, like Prince Frederick, who wowed Cinderella at the royal ball. If there was anything that Liam, Duncan, Gustav, and Frederick all had in common, it was that none of them were very happy about being a Prince Charming. Their mutual hatred of that name was a big part of what brought them together. Not that teaming up was necessarily the best idea for those guys. So as this story unfolds, you find out about all these Prince Charmings. Prince Charmings? Princess Charming. Princes Charming, and you learn that they um, are all fighting against that name that they've been giving, and they don't quite live up to the fairy tale ideal of the Prince Charming. For example, Prince Frederick, he's the one who's never 
used a sword. And he's also the one that he's never ridden a horse. He has to learn when he wants to go out into the world to find his love, Lady Ella, who has just left the castle because she wants adventure, but she finds Prince Frederick rather boring. And then there's Prince Gustav, who wants to build a reputation as a mighty warrior, as Prince Gustav the Mighty, but it's embarrassing for him, humiliating that he's been rescued by a girl. When he was thrown out of that tower by the witch, uh, he was blinded by the thorns at the bottom of the tower, but it's the tears of Rapunzel that restore his eyesight, and he's rescued. And he finds it so humiliating that he was rescued by a girl, and he wants to maintain his res reputation. The chapter is called, Prince Charming Defends Some Vegetables. On the outskirts of Stormhagen, which is Prince Gustav's kingdom, Rosilda Stiffenkraus and her family were busily plucking beets from the ground when the nearby trees parted with a rumble and a hulking troll stepped out of the forest, sniffing the air with its tremendous nose. If you've never seen one before, trolls are about nine feet tall, covered with shaggy swamp-colored hair, and may or may not have horns. This troll had one crooked horn jutting out from the left side of its head. Many people, upon seeing a troll for the first time, think they're being attacked by a big, ferocious pile of spinach. Rosilda Stiffenkraus, however, had lived in Stormhog in her entire life and knew a troll when she saw one. Oh, for Pete's sake, she sighed. Here comes another one. Come on, kids, everybody inside till it goes away. The big greenish man thing grunted and lumbered toward the farming family with a hungry smile on its hideous face. Rosilda quickly ushered her eleven children inside her, their small wood frame house, where they all watched from the window as the monster sat down amid their crops and started tossing handfuls of freshly picked beets into its mouth. Rosilda was furious. Stinking up the yard is one thing, she spat, but there's no way I'm letting that beast devour our produce. The thick-set, red-faced farmer wiped her hands on her apron, threw open the door, and marched back outside. Get your grimy hands off our beach, she yelled. Her wild and frenzy carrot-orange hair bounced with every angry word. We spent the whole morning pulling those things up, and I'll be darned if I'm going to let you gobble them all up. Rosilda picked a shovel, off, off, shovel up off the ground and raised it over her head, threatening to clobber the vegetable thief, who was nearly twice her size. Her children crowded in the doorway and cheered her on. Mommy! Mommy! The troll looked up at her, at her in shock as, a bright, as bright red beet juice ran down his chin. Ugh, oh, the thing grunted. Shovel lady hit? You're darn right I hit, Rosilda groaned growled back, unless you drop those veggies and head back into the woods you came from. The troll looked from the woman's scowling face to the long, rusty shovel she waved menacingly overhead. It dropped the handful of beets it had been about to eat. Shovel lady no hit troll, it mumbled as it stood up. Troll make no trouble. Troll go. Enter Prince Gustav. Clad in clanking fur-trimmed armor and wielding a large shining battle axe, he charged at the troll on horseback. Not so fast, beast, Gustav shouted as he approached, his long blonde hair flowing behind him. Without stopping his horse, he leapt from the saddle, turning himself into a human missile, and knocked the troll flat onto his back. The prince and the troll rolled through the garden in one clanking, grunting mass, smashing down fre freshly sprouted beet plants until the creature finally got back to its feast and feet and tossed Gustav off. The prince crashed through the wooden planks of the farmer's fence, but neatly pick, nimbly picked himself up, ready to charge the monster again. That was when Gustav spotted the bright red beet juice around the troll's mouth. Child eater, he screamed. All the children were, of course, perfectly fine, and they had actually filed back out into the yard to watch the fight. But Gustav was too focused on the monster to notice. The prince swung his axe. The troll caught the weapon in its large, clawed hands, yanked it away from Gustav, and tossed it off into a corner of the farmyard, where it shattered several barrels of pickled beets with a crunch and a splat. Starf it all, Gustav cursed which prompted some of the older children to cover the ears of the younger ones. 
Now unarmed, the prince stood face to face with the troll. The monster was nearly three feet taller than him, but Gustav showed no hint of fear. Gustav didn't really do fear. Annoyance, consternation, occasionally embarrassment. Those were emotions Gustav was familiar with, but not fear. Why angry man do that? the troll asked. Gustav charged at the creature, but it grabbed him in mid-run and lifted him into the air. The troll spun the prince upside down and rammed him headfirst into the ground with a pile-driver-like maneuver. Dazed, Gustav tried to crawl away, but the troll, still holding him by the feet, swung him to the left, smashing through a stack of wooden crates. The monster swung him back to the right, wrapping around a fence post. Gustav swung his fist at the troll, but his punch didn't even land. The creature hoisted him overhead and was ready to chuck him up into the farmhouse roof when Rosilda stepped up from behind the troll and smacked it in the back of the head with her shovel. Oh! The troll dropped Gustav in the dirt and rubbed the sore spot on his skull. Shovel lady said, no, shovel lady, no hit troll. That was before you started beating up on that poor man, Rosilda snapped. Now get out of here. But angry man hit troll first. I don't care. You get out. And she raised her shovel again. No more. No more. Troll go. And the huge creature shuffled off toward the forest. The children burst into cheers and danced around the garden. Rosilda held her hand out to Gustav, who still lay on the ground. He angrily waved the woman's hand away and stood up by himself. I had it under control, he scolded. You shouldn't have put yourself in harm's way. You know, the troll was about to leave when you jumped on him, Rosilda said. Everything was fine. And now look, you've wrecked our garden. Gustav surveyed the yard. There were broken fences, smashed barrels, squashed beets, and row after row of flattened plants. You care about a few vegetables? The monster ate your children he shouted. It did no such thing, the woman scoffed. It had blood on its mouth. Beet juice. Are you sure? Gustav asked, looking around at the giddy dancing children. It must have eaten at least one kid. Have you counted them? Now look here, my knight in shining armor, Rosilda said, as she handed Gustav the beet-stained axe he'd lost. I know men how many wee ones I've got, and none of them are in the belly of a troll. Perhaps if you'd taken a second to stop and think before you... Rosilda paused, and she stepped closer to Gustav. Wait a minute, she said with a grin. I know who you are. You're that prince from the Rapunzel story. At that point, the children swarmed around Gustav, ooing and aahing. He said nothing. Yeah, I'm sure it's you, Rosilda said. Prince Charming himself. My name is Gustav. I've been around the royal castle, you know. I've seen you there. Gustav looked stern. No, you're thinking of my brother. Um, he's charming. I'm Prince Gustav. Gustav the Mighty. Okay, your highness, Rosilda said. Why don't you open up your royal wallet and pay us for the damage you've done to our farm? I, I carry no gold with me, Gustav said with a child sitting on each shoulder, pulling at his hair. But I'll tell the royal treasurer to send you some money. He tried to walk away before the woman pried any further into his least favorite topic, but was slowed down by two more children, one sitting on each of his feet, hugging his heavy fur-lined boots. Tell me one thing, your highness, Rosilda called to him. Why didn't you get a ladder? Oh, that question again. It was more than Gustav could bear. He shook off the children who all dropped, giggling into the dirt. Pa was all he offered in response. Hey, when you get back to your castle, why don't you tell that lyrical leaf that he needs to write some new material? Rosilda said with a smirk. It's been months now. And I'm getting tired of hearing about how that sweet girl saved your life. For your information, that Weasley song spitter hasn't shown his face around Castle Sturmhagen in weeks, Gustav snarled. And I say good riddance. It's true. All of the bards have disappeared. Lyrical Leaf has disappeared from Sturmhagen, and Harmonia has lost its bard as well. Where have they all gone? So when these all of these princes come together... 
they find out, they realize that there's a plot in the kingdom. There's an evil witch who is plotting to take over. And so they have to band together and get their act together and save the kingdom. So that's all in this story called The Hero's Guide to Saving the Kingdom by Christopher Healy. The second story I have for you today is also a fantasy story, but it's set in modern times. The main character of the book could be somebody you know, uh, somebody who likes video games and likes to play jokes and things. So it's set in modern times, completely different from the fairy tale story we had before. This is called The Double Life of Danny Day by Mike Thayer. This is a new book at the library. Now the thing about new books is, is that we don't always have any digital copies. So there's no e-book, no e-audio book, but we have several copies of the print book. So you could get one from one of the branches of the library that has it. You could have it delivered to your favorite branch and you could take a look at it. So let's take a look at the cover once more. So if you see here, here we've got Danny on the top here he's got holes in his jeans he's running his shoelace is untied his shirt looks kind of rumpled and messy oh what's sticking out of his backpack a paper from school with an f on it hmm. but then when you turn it around there's another danny let's look at this danny so here he is all nice and neat his shirts aren't rumpled there's no holes in the jeans no untied shoelace and look at the grade on this paper it's an a I saw the cover, I thought, oh, I want to read this. I want to see what's going on here. But if you look here, there's a subtitle. It says, what would you do if you could live every day twice? Good question. Let's see what Danny does. I'll let him introduce himself. The Double Life of Danny Day by Mike Thayer. My name is Danny Day. I've ditched school 346 times, and I still have perfect attendance. I broke my leg last week, but I don't have a cast. I never study for a test or quiz until I've seen what's on it. I've played more than 4,000 hours of video games in the past three years, yet my parents have hardly seen me play. How is this all possible, you ask? Well, the answer is pretty simple. I live every day twice. Yeah, that's right. Since my birth some 11 and a half years ago, I've been living every day twice. Well, 11 and a half calendar years, that is. To me, it's been twice that long, so I guess in a way, I'm actually 23. That's also probably the only way in which I'm 23, though. Going through elementary school twice doesn't exactly make you an adult. The first time I go through a day, it's a discard day. It's kind of like a practice run. Nothing I say or do ever sticks. At the end of the day, I go to bed, wake up, and poof! Everything goes reset, gets reset. Except my memory, that is. Most of the time, that's a pretty cool thing. I get to do all sorts of stuff without let any lasting consequences. My standard is just faking sick and playing video games all day, but I do enjoy my fair share of pranks and stunts. Just last week, I broke my record for the most candy bars eaten in a day. Seventeen, thank you very much. I borrowed my parents' car for an evening and did donuts in the church parking lot. And I jumped off the garage roof to test my bedsheet parachute. Did I mention I broke my leg? The second time I go through a day is the sticky day. That's when everything is normal, just like it is for everyone else in the world. That's when I play for keeps and my actions and their consequences stick. As you could probably guess, Sticky Day Danny is very different from Discard Day Danny. Sticky Danny is on time to school, does his chores, doesn't draw attention, eats a fraction of the junk food, and doesn't jump off garages. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, though. Take today and tomorrow, for example. Instead of, instead of spending two days driving behind a moving truck from Houston to Idaho, I get to spend four days driving behind a moving truck from Houston to Idaho. That's when the double day becomes a curse, when I'm caught in an unpleasant situation and I can't figure a way out. You, you ever... 
You ever have the stomach flu where you're either sitting on or kneeling next to the toilet? Well, I have. Nothing quite like getting another crack at one of those days. Not to mention that when I was a little, my parents thought I was insane. Heck, I thought I was insane, always bringing up conversations and events that no one seemed to remember. It took a pretty unconventional therapist in the end to help me work through it all and convince my parents I wasn't nuts. They still don't know exactly what's going on, and, and ever since I learned to play things cool on my sticky days, they seem happy not knowing. Dr. Donaldson was a good dude, and leaving him behind in Texas was no small sacrifice. Now, if you're wondering why all of this happens, then that makes two of us. I've been reading a lot of comics lately to see how superheroes get their powers, and I've ruled out more than 150 different ways. As far as I can tell, I'm not the product of some scientific experiment gone wrong. I was never caught in a radioactive laboratory explosion, and I have never been exposed to an alien life form. The only thing I can point to is my birthday, February 22nd at 2.22 a.m. In case you were wondering, that's 2.22 at 2.22 a.m. I'm not positive, but I'm willing to bet it was also on the 22-second mark. Anyway, no matter how it happens or why it happens, just trust me, it happens. I'm Danny Day, and I live every day twice. Isn't this a cool idea for a book? What would you do if you could live every day twice? Would you want to? In what ways would it be good? In what ways bad? And I'm also wondering, is there anybody else out there? Is Danny going to meet somebody at this new school who lives every day twice? And then what happens? I just think this is a great idea for a book. I can't wait to read the rest of it and find out what's going to happen. How is he going to use this ability when he goes to his new school? How is he going to use it? And what's going to be an advantage and what's going to be a disadvantage? I bet he's going to throw a few pranks and I can't wait to find out what they are. So, we have several copies of this book at EVPL. You can take a look at our catalog at evpl.org and place a hold on it or call your favorite branch and place a hold on it that way and then you can come pick it up. So, The Double Life of Danny Day by Mike Thayer. Take a look. Thank you for joining me today on Chapter Book Storytime Variety Pack. Hope you enjoyed my stories, and I hope to see you another time. Miss Jessica will be here next week, and then I'll be back the following week with some stories to share with you. Thank you for joining me. I hope I've given you some ideas. Uh, you can take a look at all of our books, the books I read today, at evpl.org and browse our catalog. You can also look at our social media, our Facebook page, or our YouTube channel, and look at craft videos, craft demonstrations, steam demonstrations, uh, all kinds of great things to do and learn about. So I hope to see you soon, and thank you so much. Bye-bye.